Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have two guests, Dan Meek and Lloyd Marbet, both of whom have been on the show before, so we're welcome. We want to welcome them both back. Dan Meek is a, uh, an attorney here in Portland who has, uh, among other things, uh, written measures 46 and 47 for campaign finance reform limitations here in Oregon. Uh, he also wrote the initiative to turn Portland General Electric into a public utility uh, and has been um, focused on campaign finance reform and, and getting money out of the political uh, process for many years. Lloyd Marbet is an environmentalist most well known for his actions uh, several de decades ago to close the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, or excuse me, not the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, to close the Trojan. Trojan. It is the 20th anniversary of Trojan's closure. 20th anniversary of the closure of the Trojan Nuclear Plant in St. Helens, Oregon. So welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Great. Thank yeah. you, David. It's good, good. being here. Good Great. to see Dan again. Yeah. So we had an election, and we just want to talk about uh, what happened and what the prospects are moving forward. Well, I live in Klakistan now, and uh, I'm actually disappointed to discover that. Um, apparently, uh, um, Andrew Miller, who is the chief executive officer of Stimson Lumber, was successful in dumping a large amount of money into Clackamas County, first to kill the, uh, or first to pass a measure which basically will kill uh, mass transp transportation in Clackamas County, and then now involved in electing uh, the new chair, John Ludlow, uh, Tootie Smith, and so forth on the Clackamas County Commission, giving them a majority. Uh, apparently, we already have another conservative on the, on the commission, so I'm, and also I am a victim of the uh, attempt to um, rearrange the ballots at the elections office in Clackamas County. So, okay. So, how are you a victim of that? Or well, or we're all a victim of it uh, in the sense that it was discovered that one of the uh, campaign workers there was uh, uh, apparently filling out ballots that had not been completely filled out, putting in her choices. She was a Republican, and um, we have no idea. The investigation is still ongoing as to what extent that affected the outcome of the election. The two candidates, uh, Charlotte Lowen and Jamie Dimon, have basically not conceded their defeat against the more conservative uh, Tootie Smith and John Ludlow. And uh, we're waiting to see what the outcome of that is. But it's, you know, it's part of this pattern that's been showing up in recent times. Uh, you know, if you, uh, if you can't by the election up front, uh, by God, let's see if you can affect the way the votes are counted in the end. But I thought under the security plans that are supposed to be promulgated by the Oregon Secretary of State, that all handling of ballots by by election workers is supposed to be videotaped. Isn't that the case? That that supposedly is supposed to be the case, but like most um, you know, safeguards, this one apparently was not sufficient, that not all the areas in which ballots were managed were covered by the cameras, and this woman found a place where there, no one was uh, focusing a camera, so and she, she was could do her work. And she was a Republican, right? She's a Republican, right, okay. registered Republican. Okay. Yeah, right. it's, it, it's, it just it seems ironic the Republicans are constantly concerned about uh, fraud and, and uh, deception in the election process, and then they're the ones who are actually committed. Well, this, this concern, I, I think, I think um, in Oregon at least crosses party lines. The, there is a law in Oregon that's been on the books for several years now that says that all unused ballots, that is you know, blank ballots that list the candidates and measures but no votes, blank ballots, um, which are housed in each county election office, should be destroyed immediately after 8 o'clock on election night so that a, someone uh, 
an elect, for example, an election worker, these are these are temporary workers or or, or just volunteers, uh, can't you know grab some of these uh, completely blank ballots and and fill them in. And, it's always and slip, easier to fill out those <laughs> and ones. slip them into the stack. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and if these if these uh, areas that have these ballots aren't being monitored by by video cameras, and apparently not areas are, mon are monitored by video cameras, that's a that is a concern, and it's primarily the um, the uh, the Republicans, uh, in particular, or uh, Ruth Bendel, who has been um, advocating uh, that that law should be enforced, and it's the secretary, Oregon Secretary of State, who's not enforcing that law and is not requiring the destruction of unused ballots um, right at 8 p.m. on on election night. When the so election's those, over. So those unused ballots are floating around um, uh, each of the county election offices. Okay, so that's a problem. But the problem you were talking about is this person was actually taking a ballot which was received and right. had to and, fill and in. Right, and where, finishing it out. And finishing it where the, where the voter had right. filled in all the, right. all the spots. Exactly. Right, for, for, okay, all right. So obviously And there, who there knows, I mean, who knows to what extent, true extent, um, this practice was going on, whether she was part of, uh, you know, more than just uh, motivation on her own part, but whether she was a part of others that were doing it as well. I mean, it, it, it's disappointing to say the least, mm -hmm. you know, to wake up and discover that this is what's going down. And, you know, I, w I went down and demonstrated with, the, with a number of other people in Clackamas County, and I carried a sign which had a quote from Joseph Stalin, which I think says it all. You know, those who cast the vote, um, decide nothing. Those who count the vote decide everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Stalin had it. Well, Stalin had well it. I, I actually think that a, a far bigger problem is the money going into the Oh, I agree. And, I, not I, the, and, not, and probably not the, uh, probably not in, in Oregon, the counting of the votes, although it, you, you need to be, uh, to be very careful about it. Um, I well, you, all you gotta do is look at the presidential elections. I mean, you know, w the, the state, both the states of Florida and the states of Ohio have been pretty closely contested. And in Ohio, it was alleged at the time when Kerry was running in, uh, you know, uh, in the election that, in fact, you know, the Republicans, through one of the vote counting um, uh, companies that was backing up the Ohio servers that were doing the election count, had actually manipulated the outcome of the election at the very tail end of the election. It's one of the reasons why Rove apparently was not um, very interested in seeing Ohio being conceded when it was. And Anonymous is claiming that they prevented um, a actual attempt by Rove's people to manipulate the election. Now, is that true or not? I don't know. I'd like to see the truth. I'd like to see the proof of it. Um, and that's what Hartman in his article is calling for is for that evidence to be presented because it's quite significant if it's true. Well, but you don't need to cheat the vote if you can buy the vote. Oh, that's true. And in Oregon, the votes are, um, votes are subject to more money being spent on our campaigns mm -hmm. for the legislature than in any other state per capita except New Jersey. And we again broke the record in, in, in this election. Uh, Jeff Mapes uh, wrote an article in the Oregonian pointing out that um, just so far, you know, not all the counting is done, but legislative races um, were over $23 million was spent by candidates in legislative ra in Oregon legislative races this time. That compares to less than $3 million being spent in 1996, and of course the amount has gone up uh, in every two-year period. And now the, he lists some of the folks who won uh, House and Senate seats, and the winners basically spent between, oh, six hundred and $800,000. Uh, to win these contested seats. And when you consider the fact that a House seat is typically won with about 12,000 votes, you're talking about uh, candidates spending $50 per vote. Mm -hmm. And that is um, higher than, as I mentioned, any other state except, except New Jersey. And as a result, I think we can expect at the legislature sort of the same thing we've had at the legislature before, and that is no, no attempt whatsoever to limit uh, political campaign contributions. Oregon is now one of only four states without limits on political co contributions. The Oregon legislature has never adopted limits on political <laughs> contributions, and as long as the folks who are there are the ones who succeed in a system that requires that you spend half a million to a million dollars to get elected to a legislative seat, um, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Now, um, the, in the Secretary of State's race this year, 
uh, strangely enough, the Republican candidate, Newt Bueller, was a, um, a, a strong and long-time advocate of campaign finance reform. In fact, he was on the steering committee for a very good campaign finance reform measure in 1994, ballot measure 9, which was enacted overwhelmingly by the voters and then struck down by the Oregon Supreme Court in, Feb in 1997. But he lost, but in the midst of the campaign, the Democratic Secretary of State, Kate Brown, uh, promised to uh, go to the legislature and, 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 and get passed a, a joint resolution to refer to voters an amendment to the Oregon Constitution to allow limits on contributions. Of course, she promised to do the same thing four years ago and didn't do it after right. she was elected. So right. um, it remains to be seen if, uh, if she will do anything different this time around. Okay. So basically what we're left with is business as usual. Business as usual. That's right. right. Yeah. So Nothing's really changed. Right. So in, in Oregon, we haven't had any limitations. We have limitations, Measure 47, but they haven't been enforced. And, and the, and where the are Oregon we Supreme that? Court, right, that's what I was where, just asking. Where are we with that? The Oregon Supreme Court about <clears throat> two months ago uh, decided that the issue of the constitutionality of the limits in Measure 47 had not been properly presented in the case that we brought to compel the Secretary of State and Attorney General to enforce the limits in Measure 47. So I am still thinking about how to respond to that and we'll make a... How much time do you have to respond to it? Where, where, where are we in the procedural process? There's um, a motion for reconsideration can be filed and, and that's still available and, and that's something that I will do. And the, the dissenting justice, Justice Durham, uh, pointed out that the case could simply be uh, a new case could be could easily be filed that would overcome the alleged the alleged defect that a, that the that the majority of the Supreme Court decided would allow them to decide the case without really deciding any of the constitutional issues. So the media is inaccurate in the way they've conveyed this yes, because absolutely. they've been saying that the court found that Measure Forty Seven was unconstitutional. No, absolutely the not. court never made that finding. That's correct. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, here, here's yeah. another problem. Uh, right. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. the, right. the media is no longer reliable as well. Yeah. So in these other states, Oregon has this uh, uh, record-breaking expenditures mm -hmm. because we have no limitations. Mm -hmm. Most other states do have limitations, but in light of the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, are those r rules and regulations and limitations being enforced, or, or were they thrown out? as well. No, the limits on political contributions are being enforced and none of them have been thrown out. Um, well, what about Citizens Montana? United. What about Montana, which, which Montana, had a ban on corporate contributions and now the Supreme Court has basically ruled that that's unconstitutional? No, that didn't happen. Um, that was not a ban on corporate contributions. That was a ban on corporate independent expenditures. Okay. And in Montana, there was another federal court case that said, oh, the Montana limits on contributions are also unconstitutional, but that was immediately appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit stayed the, the decision of the federal district court in Montana, so those, those contribution limits remained in effect. I see. So we're talking about the difference between contributions and independent expenditures. What Citizens United was about was about independent expenditures, not about contributions to candidates. Now, we anticipated, back in when we were drafting, we all together, <laughs> right. no, measure 47, true, <laughs> uh, back in 2004 and 2005, that the, but the, um, the U.S. Supreme Court might make the kind of decision they, they finally made in Citizens United in 2010. Um, so Are you a prophet in your own time, Oh, yes. Dan? <laughs> so what we put in, in Measure 47 is that Measure 47 banned all independent expenditures by corporations or unions and limited individual independent expenditures to a total of $10,000 a year for, per individual. But we said, but if for any reason um, larger independent expenditures are made than that, that is any by corporations or unions or more than 10,000 an individual, every ad sponsored by an independent expenditure must prominently disclose the top five contributors to the, to the campaign presenting the ad, the businesses that they are engaged in, and the amounts that they've spent I on the campaign. So that would basically, for most of these, for any uh, uh, large size independent expenditure campaign, that would probably take most of a 30 second ad. And it would make, also I believe, make the ads counterproductive because if you see an ad that says, you know, vote, vote for you know, uh, Joe Blow for governor, 
brought to you by the Citizens for Good Things. Oh, that's nice. Okay, well, maybe I'll vote for Joe Blow for governor. But if it's Joe Blow for governor, brought to you by uh, Georgia Pacific, uh, we, you know, we're in the timber business and U.S. Bank, Stimson we're in the banking Lumber. business mm -hmm. and somebody else, <laughs> we're in the utility business and we each spent $500,000 on this campaign. Well, it's, you know, people will take into account the source and probably um, vote in the opposite direction. Dan, let me ask you a question. Um, oh, by the way, what that, part of, that part of Measure 47 also isn't being enforced. Uh, that's that's what I was going to ask you because I don't know if the public has a clear understanding of what's going what what was going on here. This this particular provision didn't require a change to the Oregon Constitution. We had two measures. One required, a, it, one was a change to Oregon's Constitution mm -hmm. so that you could have these limits. On so that you could definitely have them. Li and right. Definitely have limits on contributions. Contributions, but that wasn't required in order to have these disclosure. Correct. requirements. Those disclosure requirements were separate from that. That's right. And yet the Secretary of State treated the whole thing as, as, as a single package mm -hmm. and didn't enforce any, any of, of the of the measure. That's right. Hey, but weren't some of the some of the provisions of that act actually enacted anyway? No. None of them? None. None. Yeah, it was all new. And and none of them been enacted in Oregon since then. Well, the, no. Yeah, that's what I was saying. None, no. none of it actually. None. Okay. Uh, but How could what, 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 what about the reporting requirements? Because it seems like Oregon now, I know Oregon used to get Fs or, or D minuses re for reporting, and I think Oregon gets like A's and B's now for reporting. Uh, not on independent expenditures. The, the latest uh, study done by a whole group of, um, of public interest organizations uh, ranked Oregon in, uh, I think, as I recall, only seven states had worse systems for reporting of independent expenditures. Independent expenditures are not reported in the way that campaign contributions are reported on an, on an you know, internet-based electronic system. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're reported uh, separately. They're not published on the internet. They are simply put in a binder in the Secretary uh -huh. of State's office. This is kind of like Romney's binder of a uh, yeah. thousand <laughs> women. We have binders of independent expenditures, that's right. Which, which, which are difficult to find. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. So let, let, let's 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 talk about some of the what we might expect in the in the Oregon legislature. Anything in terms of campaign financing? I think you already said no, but well, I'm still hoping that maybe you'll see some no, glimmer. I would say no limits on no. Certainly, would I? You know, we'll advocate no no we'll effort, advocate but, limits on contributions. But as experience as the guide, that is, the Oregon legislature never in its history has adopted a limit on contributions. Mm -hmm. and, and Kate's not going to be coming in with the uh, constitutional. Amendment. Well, she says she is. Oh, she is this time, is she? Well, that's what. But then again, she said the same thing four years ago. Right. Okay. okay. Um, so, so any any improvements to the initiative process? Well, by if by improvements you mean destruction, <laughs> I do expect that. Um, Curiously enough, the, the folks who are defending the opportunity for grassroots efforts uh, to use the initiative process in Oregon um, are called Republicans at the Oregon legislature. Right. It's the Democrats who attack the initiative process and, have, and over, the past, over the past decade or, or 12 years have enacted so many um, really ridiculous restrictions that the number of initiatives, particularly progressive initiatives, has basically dwindled to zero. In the year 2000, there were there were nine um, statewide initiatives on the ballot that anyone I think would characterize as progressive. They did things like ban profits on dead utility plants, provided public funding for elections, uh, you know, suppo you know, supposedly guaranteed adequate funding for schools. Um, in 2002, there was one for you know single payer health care system, genetically engineered uh, food labeling. So we went from nine progressive measures in the year 2000. Down to, to the marijuana measure. To zero in 2008, to one in 2010, if you consider medical marijuana dispensaries right. to be a progressive measure, and one this year, which was the marijuana legalization measure. And, and after they had to spend over half a million dollars to get on the ballot because of the new restrictions, um, they had no money to spend on the campaign. Which, which is amazing when you think about it because the impetus for all these changes to the process is supposedly to take the big money out of it, you know, at least the, the paying of petitioners to gather signatures, but it's totally the reverse. Yeah, yeah the, the, by enacting, and this is both Secretary of State um, directives and, and by the 
Oregon legislature when it is under the control of the Democratic Party, which it has been in, in during some of the years of the last uh, last 12. Um, it simply makes, by making it all these technical requirements that have nothing to do with the validity of the voter signature, makes it very difficult for volunteers to collect signatures in a valid manner, except very experienced volunteers such as David Delk. And, <laughs> And um, Remind the, me result is, David. the result is it forces <laughs> initiatives, initiative campaigns into, into paid circulators and into um, having to pay a lot of money because of the, the number of, of signature sheets that are just thrown away. Now, in this time around, is it, the Secretary of State set new records for throwing away signature sheets and for throwing away signatures, people's signatures on, on the basis that it didn't, look, didn't exactly look like their signature on the voter registration card. As Lloyd points out, this strategy of making initiatives more expensive doesn't hurt the right wing because they've got the money. There's always going to be money for, for initiatives to limit taxes mm -hmm. because corporations and big taxpayers right. will they profit the, from it. They have the money. And there, there's always going to be um, you know, uh, uh, money for, um, any, for measures that benefit corporations because it, they've got the money to spend on it. And, it but what it does is it closes off the initiative process. Well, for it, it's worse than that. It disenfranchises voters. Voters sign these petitions with the intent of putting an issue in front of themselves that they can make a decision on. If you, if you can figure out ways to wipe out whole you know, sheets of people who've signed petitions, you're taking away that right from every Oregonian, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, it's just wrong. It, it's very so, wrong. So, so you think that we really see a deepening of this process of, of eliminating? Yes. Um, I would, every time, signatures? every session, every legislative session There's where the Democrats have been in control, they have for, since the year 2000 they have further restricted the initiative process. Right. Yeah. So talk, talk, talk about specifically how uh, signatures are invalidated or why are they thrown out? Well. Number one. Dating the sheet. Tell them that one. Well, <laughs> sure. Let's say that you're a, a circulator and you've got a, a sheet and, and, it, and there's spaces on it for, for 10 signatures. And so you collect your 10 signatures from, from folks. And then there's, a, sh there's a, um, a line for you to sign the circulator signature, which, by the way, many states with the initiative don't even require the circulator to sign at all, like the state of Washington. Washington. Mm -hmm. Washington, there's a space for the circulator signature, but if you don't sign it, it doesn't matter. The voter signatures right. are still are still counted. They're still looked up. They still look up the signature of each voter, uh, like we do here in any event. And then there's a place for your printed name, and then there's a place for a date. Mm -hmm. Okay, what date are you supposed to put on there? The date that I sign it. Okay, are you supposed to sign it before you start collecting signatures or after? Well, I know. Yeah, you're you supposed know. to do it right. after you've collected okay. But a lot signature. of people would. A lot of people don't. They start by signing it and dating it. Okay, mm -hmm. that, right. all the signatures then are invalidated. Okay, now, let's say that, I, that I'm starting to sign this sheet as, as the circulator, and I accidentally put in a, a, a capital D that's a printed D. And I went, oh, wait, that's, that's not where I'm supposed to print my name. I'm supposed to sign my name. So I cross out the printed D, and I, and I write in cursive, a cursive D, Daniel Meek. Okay? According to the Secretary of State, that's fraud. All of the voter signatures on that sheet are not counted. And, and you know what's outrageous about this, again, is the Secretary of State can go to each of the signatures on here to see if, in fact, they're valid or not. So if, if, a, if these kind of foolish mistakes are made, mm -hmm. this is just in a way in order to, you know, prevent just a, gotcha. a measure from getting sure. on the ballot. It's, it's, right. it's a gotcha. It's, it's creating fraud. And, here's, and, and uh, let's say that I, I correctly sign all of the letters of my name, and then I go to put in the date. And let's say I'm collecting signatures, it's June 1st. And I start by writing a five slash, and I go, wait a minute, it's June, it's not May anymore. Mm -hmm. What am I gonna do? Cross it out. Okay, I'll cross it out and I'll put in a six. At that point you just six, took out one, everybody that signed the petition. Okay, now that's fraud according to the Secretary of State. Right. All the signatures are right. gone. It, it, okay. It's just outrageous. Let's say I cross out the five, put in a six, and I initial it. That's what I would do on a check. Right. I would, that's what I do on a, a check of any size. Right. Anyone would just would do that. The right. bank, any bank in the world would accept do it all that. The time. According to the Oregon Secretary of State, that's fraud. Okay, let's say I make the five look like a six. That's fraud. Okay. Um, I mean, it goes on and on. Let's say like that. I, you know, it just, that's it what it is. It goes and then, on and on. As like a result that. of this sort of thing, on four measures this, in this past cycle, the 2012 cycle, 
Secretary of State threw up basically 50% of all of the signatures. Wow. Okay. And then, then you have the whole problem about people signing twice and those kinds of things were... Sure. Where if they, where if they find that a person has signed twice, they reduce your signature total by 400. Uh -huh. yeah, and, and the other problem, too, of course, is, is that the Secretary of State's partisan. You know, so mm -hmm. if there's something that's going to be hurting the party, you know, there's maybe a, a motivation to, mm -hmm. you know, especially like in, like, for instance, the candidates for office that have to use the initiative process in order to get themselves on the ballot, like wow. Nader, for instance, the manipulation of the signatures that of uh, people that signed at the convention. Okay. You know, I don't know. That, so this is, this, our, that's our, when the time is up, unfortunately. So <laughs> I, I would like to ask you both to stay. Uh, and then continue this conversation next week. Great. Is that okay? All right. Good. Thank you very All much, right. Dan. Okay. Thank you, Lloyd. Great. 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 So we have to stay here for a whole week? Uh, yes. All right. <laughs> yes. But I know you're dedicated, so I know you'll do it. <laughs> I'll do my laundry in between. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or I so, will. Okay. That's right. Dan. All right. <laughs> so we're going to have Dan and Lloyd back next week, so be sure you come back and, and watch that. Uh, in the meantime, if you uh, missed an episode of Pipe Plus Dialogues, you know that they are now on YouTube. You can go to YouTube.com, uh, search for Pipe Plus Dialogues, click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon uh, to view our shows all of this year and to subscribe to the series. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to uh, end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more about the Alliance for Democracy at the Alliance for Democracy national website, thealliancefordemocracy.org, or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. And um, I want to thank our crew today for being here and getting us on the air. So that's Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Tom Thomas, and Beth Kerwin. Thanks for being here. Thank you, for audience, for watching. We hope we'll see you again next week when we'll have Dan and Lloyd back. Thank you. Bye.